This is the Manhattan skyline in 1966. Uh, and at the time, uh, Manhattan was, like many other cities, a very dangerous place to live because of both um, because of both particulate emissions, um, dirty air, and because of lead poisoning that was routine in these cities um, because of uh, 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 leaded gasoline, um, which was most dense in urban areas. This is 66 and 72 uh, under President Nixon. The United States passes the Clean Air Act. Um, the Clean Air Act, along with subsequent amendments, the most prominent amendments being in 1990 under President George H.W. Bush, uh, cleaned up our city's air in a way that uh, city's air in a way that few could have anticipated at the time. Um, so you can see here you've got. Um, You've got uh, Manhattan. Um, you can see what happens when you don't clean up air by looking at this city, which is Beijing. Um, and in fact, if you compare uh, air in the north and south in China and look at health, uh, health and life expectancy across those two parts of the country, you get a very good sense of how much additional health and how many additional years of life you get from cleaning up city air. Um, and just recently, the Milton Friedman Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago uh, did a study um, where he looked at um, the gains in life expectancy across um, American cities due to the Clean Air Act and subsequent amendments. Now, this isn't just due to the Clean Air Act. There are many other um, uh, laws and uh, changes in the economy that have occurred. But we're talking about such large effects um, that even if the Clean Air Act is uh, only half of that, we're it's an enormous change. And in fact, the estimates are that the Clean Air Act is somewhere nationwide, accounts for somewhere between one and two years of additional life. But look at some of these cities here that were most polluted, like Phoenix, uh, and, which has over four years of additional life. A child born it today versus one born in 1970 uh, would, would live on average four years uh, longer. The second city down here uh, has a certain significance. Uh, it's, of course, home to Coke Industries. Um, and I think it's fitting that the Koch brothers, even though they oppose uh, many of the changes in law designed to improve air quality and deal with carbon emissions, get to enjoy those additional years of life. Um, because, and this is an important point, that, that even, even the rich in Manhattan were exposed to the same air. It is very hard to create your own ecosystem. And, um, and so in a way, there's a reminder here that um, although there are a lot of things that government does that involve redistribution, and I wrote about some of them in, in Winner Take All Politics, a big chunk of what government does is really what uh, game theorists call positive sum. That is, everyone is better off. Uh, because of these activities. And um, these enormous benefits um, do not end with improved air quality. You can look, and I will talk more about, across a whole range of uh, areas of government activity that involve education, health, uh, income, uh, the quality of life um, broadly understood. And you'll see again and again um, that there are these big positive sum measures um, that government has taken. And in trying to think about the way to describe this, um, I was drawn to an analogy that was used by a Yale professor uh, who actually headed the institution I now direct, the Institution for Social and Policy Studies, and his name was Ed Lindblom, Charles Lindblom. Charles Lindblom, Ed, had this analogy which was that um, uh, he said that you know all economies of rich democracies are mixed. That is, you have markets and government and the, the voluntary sector all working together. And he said the way to think about it is the the private side of this, the market, the voluntary sector, is like the nimble fingers of your hand. Um, and government is more like your thumb, right? It's the strong sort of source of counter pressure um, that allows you to grasp, grasp things. And I think it's a good analogy because it, it, it drives home this idea that, um, that I think that's often missed by people who think of government and the market as always and everywhere in opposition to each other, that, um, that you, you, know, you wouldn't want to be all thumbs, right? That would be very awkward. Um, but you wouldn't want to be all fingers either, right? You need to have that strong thumb to be able to get the most out of those nimble fingers. And, and that's the analogy that we use in the book. Um, it's to remind us that a lot of what government does is not about redistribution. And in fact, in a funny way, both the left um, with favor and the right with disfavor have come to see the uh, government mostly in, in terms of 
um, taking from some people and giving to others. Um, a lot of what it's about is, is doing those things that the market won't or can't do well, um, and I'll talk about some of those today, in ways that make us all, uh, virtually all of us, tremendously better off. And what we see in Flint, Michigan today, for example, with um, the, the tragic failure to, um, to prevent the poisoning of, of water supplies, we see a, a regression away from that, um, that capacity. That's a kind of vivid reminder that it isn't a one-way street and that if we're not careful, right, there are lots of ways in which we can um, undermine those, um, those positive sum measures. And I think that um, the, the, the story we tell in the book is in why I talk about it in terms of amnesia, um, though I didn't know all the wonderful uh, psychological features of it. The reason we talk about it in terms of amnesia is that in a way we've really forgotten um, the value of certain kinds of government activities and, um, and forgotten maybe a little benign way of putting it. I think we've had it knocked out of our head uh, because of the, the long sustained attack on government. And, and this is just very foreign to where most of our leaders were for most of our history. If you go back to our founders, they understood the need for central authority. I'll talk more about that. Adam Smith, uh, you know, Mr. Free Market understood it as well. Um, perhaps my favorite quote from Adam Smith that's never quoted by a libertarian is, taxes are a badge not of slavery but of liberty, right? That you need to have a well-functioning government to have uh, a free market. And it was understood by most of the political leaders of the mid-20th century, from uh, at least the moderate right to the moderate left. Uh, including Eisenhower um, and Richard Nixon, who established the Clean Air Act, um, to many of the major business leaders of the time, uh, and others within the moderate Republican establishment. So I want to talk mostly about why that understanding has disappeared from our public life, but first I want to just say a little bit more about uh, the mixed economy, why, uh, why this mix of a strong thumb and a nimble finger was, was so, well, great, um, and, uh, and how we can make America great again in that particular way. Okay, so I think we, most of us, think of the past as being kind of this long, gradual, upward slope. Um, although there are some who think, right, we've been going down since, I don't know, right, pick, pick your moment. Uh, Recently, there are conservatives who started saying that everything went under under Woodrow Wilson, right? Um, George Will said that he was uh, the uh, the the worst president, uh, uh, the worst president in our history, uh, the man who ruined the 20th century. So you can, I guess, go back and think of, of that. But most most people think of this as being a kind of slow, steady improvement. But if you look at our economic history, the world's economic history, it's not a story of, of slow, steady improvement. So here I just have income per head, um, and I use the US and before the United States, UK, because the UK existed for a lot longer than we did, um, but was a country that was, at the time of our founding, comparable in economic stature to us. So the story is basically a huge flat line with a massive explosion in, in incomes in the 20th century really around 1880 to 1920. But in that interval, you see a, a discontinuity in economic growth that is so dramatic, right, that it, it, it just jumps off these pages. So that even though society in the 1600s, 1700s was massively more enlightened, um, it was still extremely, extremely poor. Poor and also uh, extremely sick, uh, as we'll see in a moment. And why is it that we've seen this growth? Um, I think if you read um, a lot of the commentary about this, um, you often get the idea that it's really about these kind of in innovators who've come up with the, this, the great technology that has produced our economic growth. Um, so we used to call them in inventors, um, then we started calling them entrepreneurs, now we call them job creators. Um, these are the guys and they're mostly guys in this historical story who brought to us our prosperity. But if you think about it, why, why is our society so much more prosperous? Well, it's obviously because of this technology, but also because of the massive accumulation of knowledge and the capacity to use it. And the biggest measure of that is, is education, right? If you think about who the job creators are, the American uh, worker, 
with uh, his or her uh, additional years of schooling. And we, as a society, uh, were very different from European countries in our early commitment, first to K through 12 and then to secondary education. And arguably, that was the defining difference, or at least a defining difference, between the US and other rich democracies. And you can see here it's something that I'm going to elaborate on in this talk, which is the inflection point right? in recent decades. So in general, in a lot of these things I'm going to talk about, it's not that we've like plummeted uh, into some morass of, uh, of, of, of bad performance, but rather that we're doing less and less well translating our, gain, our income gains and our overall uh, economic potential into improvement in people's lives. Uh, so things are getting better, but far, far too slowly, and, and, and particularly far too slowly for those in the middle and the bottom of the economic ladder. So when Eric Cantor, uh, the uh, former uh, House Minority Whip who was knocked out by a Tea Party candidate a few years back, tweeted on Labor Day, today we celebrate those who have taken a risk, worked hard, built a business, and earned their own success. Because yes, everybody knows that Labor Day was set, set aside to honor America's business owners. Um, he's, I think, really, he's really encapsulating this idea. And I think this idea, which is, if there's one thing you can take away from this talk, I hope, is that, um, you know, to use that old joke, a lot of the folks who say it's all about this tiny slice of the intellectual, innovative elite, that they're really making that fundamental mistake that was once, uh, 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 that Ann Richards once directed at George W. Bush, that he was born on third and thought he'd hit a triple, right? <laughs> that he, all of these enormous ways in which we are lifted up as a society and these individual entrepreneurs are lifted up as a society by prior investments are forgotten um, in this valorization of the heroic individual. And, you know, I'm always pleased when there are people who really buck the trend. Warren Buffett, of course, recognizes this, uh, this important and role. Bill Gates has talked about it. The one I, I think about the most because he just passed away is Andy Grove. Um, uh, someone came up to me and was telling me about um, their time at Cooney. Um, uh, and uh, Andy Grove went to the City College of New York uh, for free tuition. He wasn't so pleased with New York, so he went out west and he got a PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, which is a land-grant college, so established under the Merrill Act of um, 1862, signed by Lincoln. In fact, if you go to the Campanile at UC Berkeley, and you should, it's an amazing spot, you go down to the base of it, there's a statue of Lincoln or a bust of Lincoln, and that's there, not because of emancipation, but because uh, UC Berkeley was created as a land-grant college. So too were all, almost all of the major research institutions that seeded uh, America's technological edge, including MIT. Um, MIT uh, brought us Vannevar Bush, a uh, scientist who then became the head of the Defense Department's research agency ran the uh, Manhattan Project and after World War II um, was where he envisioned and fought for the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation and said we should spend more, and we did spend more than every other country combined on research and development, allowing us to have enormous breakthroughs in computers that Andy Grove was able to build on. In fact, when Andy Grove went uh, into the private sector, he went to Fair, Fair, Fairchild Semiconductors, which was essentially a company created by the Defense Department to produce transistors and circuits. Um, and then he went on and founded Intel, of course. Um, and, but all his life, he recognized how important it was for these, the, getting to third base, these, these investments that have been made. So Van Iver Bush, who, um, who played such a pivotal role in creating this system that helped Andy Grove, well, he was a conservative Republican. Um, just to give you a sense and he, uh, of where things were at this time in terms of thinking about this. So we became the world's leading scientific power uh, during the World War II in a way that I think is easy to see in retrospect. If you look at Nobel Prizes, for example, right, the United States is nowhere and Germany is the, the dominant nation. And you can see here, right, that after uh, 19... Uh, the 1940s, the U.S. emerges as a scientific superpower, and it's actually one of the things that I think often gets neglected when people talk about, you know, our, we're, how endangered we are. I think we are not making the kinds of investments that we should, but the fact is, is that compared with countries that we often cite as our competitors, like China, we still are the most innovative and scientifically advanced, uh, and that's worth a lot, and it was a result of public investments, substantially a result of public investments. Yeah, I could go through the list, but my favorite example of this is, um, I'm timing this with my iPhone here. Uh, if you took your iPhone apart, and I don't recommend this, um, every component of the iPhone uh, was due to government subsidized research. Um, everything from touchscreen technology to um, 
to a GPS to the internet on which uh, iPhone runs, um, and uh, even Siri. Not the voice itself, I assume that that was Apple's own contribution, but the voice recognition software started as a Defense Department project. The other side of this story, um, in, in terms of improved life, uh, is, uh, is opportunity, right? So here is the Harvard Business School class of 1930 or so. Um, all the diversity that you can see there is, uh, is in facial hair. Um, and, um, and so what is this? I think it's really important, right? Because at the time that we had these bitter fights in the 60s and 70s about opening up universities and other institutions to women and minorities, it was seen really as like we've got to give them something. But in fact, all the research suggests that we are massively richer because of that. I think one, one recent study found that about one-fifth of our increased uh, income since the 1960s uh, was, is due to increased opportunities for and better placement of women and minorities. So this was not just about redistribution, it was also about broadening um, in a positive some way the capacity to use the talents, the dispersed talents of citizens. So investing in citizens' talents, broadening their use, creating the knowledge and scientific infrastructure to make all this possible. And one thing it made possible was, was massively longer lives. So I just showed you that figure that um, it went back to essentially one uh, AD. This one only goes back to 1550, but I promise you that it looks exactly the same if you go back before 1550. So first of all, you see here plagues, uh, black death, yellow <laughs> fever. Um, but what do you also see, right? So you see that essentially, again, up until around 1900, just before 1900, um, life expectancy hadn't changed at all. And actually, if you go back, you'd find that the Greeks and the Romans had about the same life expectancy. Most of the reason for low life expectancy in the world was, well, there were two. One was uh, infant mortality, which was about 3 in 10 in most urban centers in the United States at the turn of the 20th century. Um, the other was, of course, maternal death. Um, and both of those, um, infant death and maternal death in childbirth, uh, were dramatically um, addressed in the 20th century, and particularly infant death and infection. And this was just an, an, almost entirely a story of good public policy. Now, it was replacing some bad public policies because many municipal water supplies were essentially pulling refuse back into the city uh, that it was being sent out um, through the rivers. And, um, and so cleaning up water, making um, pasteurized milk available to infants, dramatically transformed the reality. So um, probably uh, between the early 20th century and 1940, we're probably talking about 16 additional years of life, and roughly half of that is just due to children living uh, past their first birthday, right? And just to think about that, and put yourself, in, if you're a parent, in the shoes of someone like Thomas Jefferson, right, who lost so many of his own children, or Grover Cleveland. I mean, these were presidents. They had all of the advantages one could expect uh, of a lead at the time, and that they, they were not able to protect their own children from infectious disease. Um, and again, when we talk about antibiotics and vaccines, these were substantially due to public at uh, investment and regulation, right? Getting people to have vaccines was really a, a project that required public authority. Um, a last point before I move to what's happened, um, and just a little bit more on the mixed economy. Um, and that is that this was not all some kind of kumbaya um, process where everyone got together and said, oh, absolutely, we, we, we know what we need to do and let's do it together. And there's cases like that, and I think one of the things that increased education did was allow more people to learn about some of these vital scientific breakthroughs. But a lot of it was just about basically telling people what to do. And this gets back to that kind of uncomfortable truth and why the strong thumb of government works. It's that you, the strong sum of government can tell people what to do. Um, and in particular, it can tell private corporations what to do. So what's the greatest public health triumph of the late 20th century as opposed to the early 20th century? The early 20th century, it's cleaning up water, right? That's the greatest public health triumph. The early 20th century, the late 20th century, it's tobacco, right? Getting uh, smoking levels rates down. And if you go back, right, we were escalating up through the 1960s until the, you don't need to see these, these little things, they're just all about various Surgeon General's reports, uh, taxes and regulations on cigarettes, banning of advertising. And the point is, is that in the mid-1960s, about the same time as the Clean Air Act went into effect, 
we reversed the trajectory of smoking in the United States. Um, and other rich countries saw as a, us as a pioneer in doing this. In the liberty-loving United States, we were able to discourage smoking, so much so that about 8 million uh, lives were saved over this period. Or think about lead. Uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier, lead levels were very high in urban centers. Why? Because, not because of paint, although that's part of it, but mostly because uh, that's where density was what produced um, uh, 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 lead, high lead levels in the soil. And, and so, oh, sorry, I have to do this. So the other day, the NFL uh, had this, there was this big piece in the New York Times about concussions, and the NFL wrote, and they compared the strategies that were being used by the NFL to the, those used by the tobacco industry, and the NFL wrote a letter to the New York Times that said that the tobacco industry was, among other things, the most odious industry in American history. Um, I'm not a big um, uh, uh, football fan, but um, my co-author Paul is, and he says to me, when the NFL says you're bad, you must be really bad. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, and these folks didn't say, I just want to be clear, these folks didn't say, you know, your science is right, and, but we really think people should have the, you know, have the um, choice um, to, to smoke, and we're going to make sure that they're, you know, of adult age, and they're informed of all the risks. No, they, they, they denied Right? They fought tooth and nail, the regulations. Um, and this was true not just in, t in, t in tobacco, it was also true in lead. Um, so Flint, Michigan, right? Um, the, um, the horror of Flint, right, is that something like 10% um, uh, of the school of the preschool age pop of kids in Flint now, or at the time of the peak of the crisis, had blood elevated blood lead levels um, above five uh, micrograms per deciliter, which is now described, as it says on this last one, as sort of the the upper limit. And in fact, you know, going just from like one to two micrograms per deciliter to four or five is is a significant decline in I, in kids' IQ. It will cause a significant decline in kids' IQ and impulse control and in um, so here's the kicker, right? These are average blood lead levels I'm going to show you in a moment. Average. Right? So in 1975 or 1971, when I was born, the blood lead levels on average among preschool age kids was over 20 micrograms per deciliter, right? So, I mean, it's just quite amazing I'm standing here today in some ways, right? Like, I, thankfully, they, they phased out lead, or I would never, ever have been able to become a professor. Um, so, and, well, I grew up in a small college town. That probably helped. But, um, so this dramatic decline, again, was not an accident. It was um, the uh, telling companies, state by state, and then finally at the federal level, that they had to stop using uh, uh, ethyl lead in their gasoline. Why was ethyl lead in the gasoline? Well, everyone knew it was poisonous, not that it was as bad as it was, um, but the DuPont, uh, the du DuPont Industries uh, fought it tooth and nail because it was an anti-knock agent that they had uh, patented and which was um, making them literally millions and millions of dollars a year. And um, here was the executive of of uh, DuPont um, of Ethel in 1976 calling this the worst example of fanaticism since the New England witch hunts in the 17th century. Here are two um, elderly women enjoying uh, the powerful difference that high octane gasoline makes. But that was, you know, physicians were prescribing, making sure, you know, 20,679 physicians say that Luckies are the best for you. And um, why does gasoline smell good? Gasoline is fuel. Smelling it creates energy by burning through all the brain cells that make you think. Okay, wow. that, that actually is just a made up one. I just wanted to check to see if you guys were watching. But the fact that you think it could have been real, now that would have been great. Well, we love gas. We love to sniff gas. Okay. Big part of what the strong thumb does is push back against corporations when seeking profits, they undermine the public good. And, and there's lots of cases where that's going to happen, right? There's nothing that, that guarantees that nice alignment that Smith uh, w wrote about when the invisible hand works. Sometimes the invisible hand will produce pollution, right? Because neither side in the market transaction is taking that into account. Sometimes people don't actually understand the risks that they are taking. Um, there's myo we all suffer from uh, myopia uh, in important decision making. And sometimes uh, there are goods that the market just won't provide. For example, the kinds of public investments in research and development that no company can claim full control of, right? So a lot of the biggest breakthroughs in science, right, involve things like calculus. Think of calculus have been patented, right? Um, I'm sure Apple is right now trying to write a patent for it, but they're not going to get it, right? Um, and so too... Um, 
So too, um, you know, many of the big breakthroughs in antibiotics and vaccines uh, were done, for example, the penicillin uh, vaccine, which was sort of done through a Manhattan project by the federal government during World War II. They actually didn't, it wasn't patented. It, they, they freely gave uh, the patents to all uh, companies to produce them and created by, the, by doing so the biomedical industry in the United States. So, and I just want to be clear, I'm not saying that we should always allow new research and development to produce um, goods that aren't patentable. I mean, it's clear that that has some incentive for innovation, but there are certain public public goods that are really something that, that, that companies won't produce because they're essentially available to everyone, and therefore the incentive for them to produce it is weak. And that's another area where public investment is crucial. So what? So, so I've described this, what seems like a pretty good set of um, decisions uh, that proceed up until the 1970s and involve Republicans as well as Democrats, right? Richard Nixon uh, and, and Dwight Eisenhower as well as uh, JFK and LBJ. I mentioned, though, I, and I won't say much more about it, but that the business leadership at the time was pretty supportive of a lot of these things. So what happened? And when, I, when I'm in the book, and I think you know, this is one of those cases where I can you know, literally say, read the book. Um, it, I, but in the book, I tell this, we tell this story through two figures. Mitt Romney, right, is a, is a blue state Republican who runs for president and represents both a business uh, and political leader of his day. Well, his father on the left, George Romney, was as well. Uh, he was a Michigan governor. He was a very progressive Republican. He ran against um, conservative Republicans. And he lost, like his son, in the fight for the presidency. But in, in almost all the ways that matter, these were very different figures. Um, so George Romney ran a manufacturing company, um, American Motors Corporation. He also headed the Automobile Manufacturers Association. And he, um, and he was someone who very much argued that, this, that the heads of corporations had to really have a, a bond with the community and with their workers. He turned down a large raise, for example, and, and said famously that um, rugged individualism is nothing but a political banner to cover up greed. Um, when he was running for president, he was dismissive of Goldwater and essentially said that he thought that the more um, ideological Republican Party that was forming, the more conservative Republican Party that was forming, the one less appreciative of this mixed economy um, was going to splinter the nation. Um, di dogmatic ideological parties tend to splinter the political and social fabric of a nation, lead to governmental crises and deadlocks, and stymie the compromises so often necessary to preserve freedom and achieve progress. Um, so fast forward a generation, and his son, Mitt Romney, um, runs for president after actually pursuing some uh, some fairly pragmatic reforms in his um, in the state he was governor of Massachusetts. But of course, he doesn't run to fight against the Goldwater wing. He runs to be part of the much more conservative party, Republican Party. And um, this is the most famous quote, of course, the 47 percent quote. And and I think it's really. You know, people kind of dismiss it as like, well, he was just catering to the um, to the fund, the, you know, the funders of the party, which is itself pretty revealing. But I think what I find revealing about it is not that it was Mitt Romney who said it, it was that this was obviously something that was being said by a lot of top Republicans at the time, and it reflected a view that was very different. Um, than the view that said we are a community, uh, or the view, even the view that Ronald Reagan had, which was that most people are upstanding and we just got to deal with that sort of small circle of recalcitrant uh, welfare cheats. Um, this view is basically the welfare queen is now 47% of the population that's not uh, paying income taxes, and this gets back to this idea that uh, what we call of uh, what we call Randianism. So at the extreme. And Ayn Rand, um, you know, is the, by the way, has the best-selling, Atlas Shrugged is the second best-selling book of the 20th century behind the Bible. So this is not a trivial um, uh, figure. Ayn Rand, uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, uh, she inspired um, everyone from Paul Ryan to Alan Greenspan. Um, she, she argued not that there was a small circle of people to, you know, who, were, um, who were in need of help or, or reform. She really argued that capitalism as a system rested on this tiny, tiny circle of innovation, uh, innovative people, and that everyone else was a looter or a moocher um, using government to feed off of this small elite. And that's why the strike, right, they go, you know, John Galt leads the strike of the capitalists um, to basically say, we're not going to let ourselves be used anymore. This is a view that I think is still a fringe view within um, the, the circles of, of top um, uh, economic 
uh, um, figures in the United States, but a sort of milder version of it, I think, is very widely, w widely held. Um, and so we talk about in the book a kind of soft Randianism, right, rather than the hard Randianism uh, that is um, that is displayed in this kind of 47% view. So to me, there was another quote from Romney that got a lot less play that I think um, was at least as important, and maybe this is partly because I'm a college professor um, that I think this, but so a student um, came up, or a, a, high school, a high school student came up and asked in a town hall meeting how he was going to play for college, and, and Romney basically said, you know, shop around. He said, it would be popular for me to stand up and say I'm going to give you government money to pay for your college, but I'm not going to promise that, and don't expect the government to forgive the debt that you take on. And the crowd was really into it, and I don't think they should have been. It's not that I think that there aren't really important questions about how we deal with escalating college costs or the kinds of policies we need to ensure um, that, um, that we can afford the invest these investments in education, but the basic idea that we should should we have a stake in whether kids get through college seems to me unassailable. Um, and we've gone from being the world leader in college completion uh, to being in the, in the, in the low teens um, in college completion. And we've done so in significant part because of disinvestment in college, um, including and perhaps most notably at the state level at places like UC Berkeley where Andy Grove uh, went. And so again, this idea, this is a more of a soft Randian view, that there isn't a stake in these kinds of basic um, public investments in goods, seems to me to now have become so broad that we don't even recognize it. And so I want to end by asking, well, how do we get that recognition back? What, what can we do? Um, and, um, and, I, and I think the first thing I want to say is that, um, is that this is... Um, this is partly about the change in the nature of, of the business community. And so I have not talked much about this, but the Chamber of Commerce, the Koch network, um, we mentioned Charles and, and David Koch before, the Chamber of Commerce is a, just a very different kind of organization than we've seen. It's a different organization than the Chamber of Commerce was 15 or 20 years ago. Tom Donahue, who's really brought it to prominence, has done so with the slogan, show me the money. That's his plaque on his desk. And one of his associates says he gets his rocks off on just saying, pounding his desk and saying, show me the money. And what does he want the money for? He wants the money to lobby for narrow private interests. So when I was uh, in the healthcare debate in 2009 and pushing for, uh, I'm called the father of the public option, when my child was unfortunately stillborn in 2009 due to the opposition of many, including our own home state senator, Joe Lieberman, um, and uh, when I was pushing for that, the America's health insurance plan was saying, no, we're, we're for reform, but they were funneling 100, roughly $100 million um, through the Chamber of Commerce. And it's gotten worse than that. He, you know, he's, it, it's lobbying on behalf of tobacco companies. In fact, there's been some defections from the Chamber uh, in their work abroad to try to ensure that people uh, continue to smoke in poor countries. And so this view of kind of mercenary organization is, uh, and very closely tied to the Republican Party, is very different than the business community was even 30 years ago, and certainly than it was um, when many of these investments were, were first made. And the, the, I, there's a real cost to this kind of catering to private interest. I mean, you think, well, not that much is happening in Washington, but actually a lot happens beneath the radar. Um, and it's groups like this that are so well organized and have the resources that are able to do that. It's also the case that failure to act is often a really big goal of these organizations. And so a lot of the crony capitalism, as it's sometimes called in Washington, concerns cases where we really need to have some better government policies, but we can't get them because of the opposition of these powerful private interests. You know, the, in the book we call these interests the modern robber barons. These were the original robber barons. They had these beautiful castles on the Rhine, and the reason they were so close to the river was that they would spread chains across the river uh, to prevent ships from passing and make them pay exorbitant tolls, um, simply for the privilege of, of, of taking their trade uh, down river. And that really shut off European economic growth um, for, for, for 500 years or so um, uh, during the, uh, the 1300s uh, to, to around the 1500s. And um, the, the robber barons today are less visible, but they have a similar kind of logic, right? So if you're in energy, right, and you want to emit carbon into the atmosphere, um, or if you're in healthcare and you don't want to have to um, have prices that are closer to the international norm, or if you're in finance and you'd like to do risky things that are going to create risk for other people, you try to lobby to have government less involved, um, less uh, uh, using its strong thumb less rather than more. 
And that's why, as I think, it's pretty clear that's one of the reasons why our healthcare system has such an unenviable record of massively high costs and, and relatively bad outcomes. And, and you see that when you get, you know, when you're spending more, you usually get more in terms of life expectancy, except for the United States, right? You spend more than twice as much as any other country, but doesn't seem to get that much uh, in basic health from it. And, and, and the basic reason for that, as most of those who study healthcare know, is that our prices are just on another planet compared with other rich democracies because of the, and so when people say, well, we haven't let the market work in healthcare, and um, I think what they have to ask is, well, these countries, they use their governments much more aggressively, and yet they seem to have better outcomes. So maybe the, the answer isn't uh, more markets, maybe it's more effective government. And But how do we get there, right? How do we get to more effective government? That's the question. I think that's that's a hard question to answer because of the, just the pervasive skepticism that we have about government, all of us, right? Um, I don't know how many times I've given talks on this book where people come up and they say, look, you know, Bernie tells me government's totally hopelessly corrupt, but um, so what can we do, right? We need a, you know, we need a political revolution. Um, we need to completely overthrow uh, the, the, the reigning order. And, and so there's a kind of pessimism and skepticism together, and it's, it's the main reason, I think, that most Americans are having a hard time um, grasping the reality, right, that there are many areas uh, where we actually need to be doing more uh, together through our government um, rather than less. Think of the IRS, for example, right? Ted Cruz says he wants to abolish the IRS, which raises some obvious questions about how he will finance his initiatives. Um, well, wh why, why do we want to get rid of the IRS, right? I mean, I, I can think of an ideal world in which uh, government has as massive amounts of money and there are no taxes. That world doesn't exist anywhere except for Saudi Arabia, and it's going down the tubes, right? In rich democracies, where that badge of, of not of slavery but of liberty that Adam Smith wrote, about is worn, you've got to collect taxes um, to do things. And the United States is a country in which we seem to be um, destroying the capacity of the IRS to do its basic job. And you know the, the, the result is, just recently, the IRS re released a report that the latest uh, estimate of the tax gap is about a half a trillion dollars. That is, taxes that are owed but not paid. Um, that half trillion dollars is money that we who pay taxes all have to pay. It's money that um, means higher deficits, higher interest costs, less capacity to deal with the real challenges we face as a nation, um, like the huge disinvestment that we're doing right now, not just in education, but in research and development, in our in infrastructure and other areas that are vital for our prosperity. So we need to see government again as a force, not just, uh, not just a, a necessary uh, e evil, but as a as a as a as a as a positive good when it when it is operate when it operates well, and I think most Americans feel as if um, it doesn't operate well, and so the question before us, I think, really, and this is public trust in government. You can really see, you know, from the period that we're writing that I'm writing about and talking about here before the 1970s. Um, you know, public trust in government was very high. It's been persistently low since, and so. In thinking about how to reverse this trend, I think that there are, there's some actual good news on the table. I told you I wouldn't, you wouldn't need psychological services uh, after this. Um, I actually think there's some good news on the table. And, well, there's good news because there's money on the table. There is a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities for us to make um, even relatively modest investments with big returns. Um, because in some ways, right, we've not been doing a very good job. There's actually, I know this is perverse, but there's actually a lot of places where um, if we made just did slightly better than we're doing now in investing in roads and bridges and transport and communication infrastructure and research and development and the like, the returns are going to be huge. Um, and the other reason why I'm optimistic, and of course that creates, right, that having those returns creates the opportunity for positive sum bargains, right? The other reason I'm optimistic um, is that if you go back and look at this history, I mean, I, I at least thought when you go back and look that it would be the story of like this one big reform that did it all. But it's not, right? It's people like Van Ever Bush, as well as FDR. It's um, these sort of forgotten stories of the people who are cleaning up milk and water in the early 20th century. There was no magic bullet, right? There was just lots of slow and steady and uh, improvements um, in the capacity of government. And that was in tune in tandem with improvements in the way our democracy was functioning. So, you know, I think that we're far too negative often about government. That you never see the headline that is probably the most accurate one, which is things are getting better slowly 
because of government, right? You never see that. It's not exciting, but it's often true, right? And you see the headline about our failure in Ebola, not the fact that we've dealt, that we've dealt much more effectively with that crisis uh, than the media suggested. You see the headline saying, well, we're, we're, we're going down to, you know, going to hell in a handbasket, not the fact that we've really reversed the fiscal slide that so many people were worried about um, 10 or 15 years ago. You, you have to recognize the very, very many ways in which um, things are getting better, too slowly, but, um, but really getting better because we're using government sometimes effectively. So, so what's it going to take to do that more? I think, you know, obviously one thing it's going to take is more mass pressure on, on elites. And, and, and I think this is the mistake we often make, is that to think that the elites of, of the mid-20th century were somehow better people, right? That they were, they were the greatest generation of elites ever, right? I'm sure that's the next Tom Prokop book, right? The greatest generation of elites. But they were not fundamentally different. They, they had some experiences that sensitized them in a way that many elites today aren't, such as the Great Depression and World War II. But at the same time, they were under pressure. They had to bargain with other actors. And that strong thumb of government, right, was there. Think about the closest we've come to climate change action in the United States, right? It was during the 2009 um, uh, battles over health care and financial reform. Why was it that so many corporations came to the table and a lot did? Because the EPA was going to act, right? The EPA was going to regulate greenhouse gases as a carbon emission. When you change the calculus so that action and pressure, right, are on the agenda for, for, the, for folks in positions of power, they change their positions. They don't change perhaps what they want ultimately, but they change where they stand. And look what's happening in North Carolina right now, right? Business groups, when they want to, can get out there and make things happen. And so the pressure is only going to come through the kind of popular upheaval, popular um, investment, the increase uh, in voting that we're, that we're seeing uh, uh, Bernie Sanders advocate for. Um, but it's going to take place, unlike I think what Sanders thinks, it's going to take place when elites accommodate. And so uh, in the book we talk a lot about how you might make that happen. Um, it's going to um, require that we remember some of the, um, the, the great figures of our history that we've now lost in this mist of time. I think the, the, I want to close really by just um, reminding us of this, that our founders were not um, anti-government libertarians, right? Quite the opposite. The founding moment is now forgotten. It's, it's like this, we get the Seinfeld version of the Constitutional Convention, right? Revolution yada, 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 constitution, right? But there's a big thing in the middle, and that yada, 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 right? The Articles of Confederation, which were an abject failure, right? All of the founders came because the federal government lacked the power to tax, lacked the power to regulate, lacked the power to conduct military affairs. They were convinced, and rightly so, that the country was about to be lost. Um, and so everyone from Jefferson to Hamilton says, because we had a revolution against power, uh, against tyranny, that it was, it was nothing was more natural than that the public mind should be influenced by an extreme spirit of jealousy. The zeal for liberty became predominant and excessive. excessive. The object certainly was a valuable one and deserved our utmost attention, but sir, there is another object equally important in which our enthusiasm rendered us little capable of regarding, I mean, a principle of strength and stability in the organization of our government and vigor in its operations. And that principle is much more relevant today in a complex and interdependent world. And, and so we need to bring back that understanding. We need to break out of that amnesia. And when we do, we'll, 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 we'll see our political elites maybe saying things like this. And what's really striking about this quote is that it was said not by LBJ or JFK or Martin Luther King. It was said by Paul Hoffman, the CEO of Studebaker, who headed the major business organization of the mid-20th century. That's what we need, a broad recognition, as we put it at the end of the book, that the government that governs best has to govern quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Terry.